Hello. Hello. Our next speaker is Dr. Cynthia Osborne. And Mr. Oh my goodness, it's been a long day. Cynthia wears many hats. She's the Associate Dean for Academic Strategies and the Director for the Center for Health and Social Policy at the LBJ School of Public Affairs. And she also founded and directs the Child and Family Research Partnership and Dr. Osborne's evaluations of state and national programs in areas such as home visiting, child welfare, and child support have helped organizations understand what works and how to sustain effective interventions. And I think most importantly to today's discussion, Dr. Osborne recently launched the Prenatal to Three Policy Impact Center, which has become a resource for state leaders that explains which policies are most likely to improve outcomes for young children and their families. And if you haven't already done it, I strongly encourage you to download the policy roadmap. It is informative, it's very enlightening, and there's also a couple surprises. And so Dr. Osborne's work is top notch, but I will say one of the things that really sets Cynthia apart from her peers is her ability to connect people across disciplines. And as you know, that cross-discipline work is a theme of today's summit. And I will also say that her focus on policy could not be better timed after what we just heard from Dr. Shankoff. When we talk about moving upstream, the way I'm starting to think of it is policy is that paddle that we need to row further upstream against the current. So without further ado, even though we are virtual with all the technical difficulties of our new virtual, please help warmly welcome Dr. Osborne. Well, Thank you, Kim. I really appreciate that introduction and always the ability to work with you and all that you've been doing for kids in Central Texas and really across the nation. And I'm excited to have the opportunity to talk with so many folks today. I know that this is a group that spans both physicians and healthcare providers as well as social service workers. And it is the idea of us all coming together to talk about how we can really move the mark on improving the life uh, outcomes for our littlest ones. It's just such an important discussion. So I'm really grateful to be able to be a part of it. I am going to share my screen. Um, we'll hope that technology doesn't let me down here either, but uh, to provide uh, some input for you. Let's see. Um, it is possible that you're going to see my screen, but I don't think so. Let's see. Um, any chance that you actually see that? <laughs> if Kim, if someone could let me know. Um, let's see. I think. Can you see my uh, PowerPoint? Yes, Cynthia. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Great. All right. Thank you. I'm sorry. I wasn't um, sure if, if it was uh, showing up or not. Um, so again, my apologies for the technology uh, problem here. But um, as Kim noted, we have recently launched the Prenatal to Three Policy Impact Center uh, at UT Austin at the LBJ School. And really, the center was built on all of the things that Jack was just talking about. Um, his work and those that he um, helps to translate their work has just been so transformational to the field in our understanding of how children develop and how important those earliest years are. And so you know, we um, wanted to bring to life that science of the developing child, this understanding that early on nurturing relationships really are the key to building that self-regulation, executive functioning, and that by trying to reduce chronic adversity, we will help children um, to not uh, have to be in that constant survival mode. And we are certainly very attuned to the idea, though, that children are incredibly resilient, that we will never give up on them. But it is a lot more difficult uh, and expensive to undo some of the things that we could have done better uh, at, by supporting kids in the earliest years. We're also motivated by the notion that 
we cannot just take care of the kids. We as a society have to care for the caregivers so that they can care for the kids. And this is true for both caring for the parents and ensuring that they have the knowledge and skills and resources that they need to be, or that they need in order to be the parents that their children deserve but also that we're uh, caring for other providers, in particular our child care providers. A study that we did on child care providers here in Central Texas um, and also in Washington State, we found that of all the child care teachers that uh, we surveyed, that about two out of five reported major depressive symptoms and also food insecurity. And so, if we have folks who are trying to care for our kids who are having a hard time caring for themselves, then we know that that isn't going to lead to optimal outcomes. We're also motivated by the fact that it takes a system. Um, Jack said this again and again, as well as Sasha and Katie and Kim, that there is no magic bullet or single institution that can do it all. It cannot be uh, that it's the healthcare system that's doing it all. It cannot be that it is child care. Um, it has to be the family in the center with our health care, our child care, our employment, our social service, all these institutions working in concert in order to really meet the needs of the families. And in the research that we've done, we've identified that it's important that we have both a, a set of broad-based policies that ensure that families' basic needs are met that when they work, that it actually pays, <laughs> and that they can balance both caring for their children and um, uh, providing for them as well. In addition to those broad-based policies, though, we need targeted programs that do address specific needs that are identified or really work to prevent um, certain things that we can uh, uh, note of kids and actually try to um, improve before things would get even worse. And these targeted, more specific interventions may actually be much more impactful with uh, broader economic supports and family supports to back them up. And finally, we're motivated by the idea that early investments pay off, that the research is um, you know, clear that when we invest early um, in our children and in fa families who have young children, that we see short and long-term benefits, um, both in the use of uh, different sorts of services and improvements in behavior um, and contributions to society writ large. So it's not only just the child and the family that benefits, but it is all of us. In Texas, this is just a a, an example of the difference of types of investments that we make. And it costs about $9,000 a year for the average child um, in child care. And that's expensive. It's a lot for any family member to try to pay. Um, and it's a lot for the state to try to uh, supplement. But it costs us over $22,000 for each person that we incarcerate. And um, it's not to say that any kid who doesn't get child care is going to end up in prison. That's not what I'm saying. But you can see the trade-offs that, um, that we would have to make. If we invest early, we will end up um, really setting these kids off onto a path of success. So in light of all of what we know about the importance of the earliest years for children, we um, set some goals for this new Policy Impact Center. We are academics by training and um, wanted to bring to the field what the evidence says are the most effective policies or strategies that really create the conditions in which children thrive. We want to be a trusted source of information, not just for Texas, but for all states, so that we can really identify what we know and importantly, what we don't know and still need to learn. And we want to learn from each other. We want to learn from various uh, states of, of what they're doing so they can share their successes and um, make sure that we don't replicate any of the um, challenges that states face. And we also wanted to make sure that by being out in the field, that will be informing the research that we do so that we can ensure to include information about implementation 
about the lived experience that will really enhance the research we do, make it more impactful, uh, and make policies more equitable. We have three guiding principles that really are behind all the work we do. The first is that we believe strongly in this idea of investing the earliest years for children, but this has to mean that we invest in the children's families and the institutions that serve them, that it can't be that we just say, give us your kids and we'll take care of them, that the families and the child care providers and the health care providers, all of them need our support and investment in order to really um, promote the optimal health and well-being of our infants and toddlers. We also are doing this because of the persistent disparities by race and ethnic group, by socioeconomic status, that um, exist and we want to eliminate these disparities. We want to see how our policies both perpetuate uh, any disparities and can actually reduce or eliminate them. And like I said, although we're academics, we are definitely guided by the evidence. We wanted to turn to what the studies have told us about what works. We're extremely mindful that the evidence can only take us so far and that there are limits we haven't studied everything that works and you know, there's so much left to learn, um, but we are committed to trying to build that evidence base so that when we are spending scarce public dollars, that we're doing it in the most effective and efficient way that we can. The Policy Impact Center is um, con contributing four primary resources to the field. The first is our policy clearinghouse. And in this vein, we turned to all the experts in the, across the states and said, tell us about the different policies that are taking place in various states. And we looked to uh, the research based on um, our own expert knowledge. And we uh, reviewed a couple of dozen policies that states have been implementing and that have been researched that we could say, these are the ones that uh, we know are effective and these are the ones in which we need to learn more about. From all of those comprehensive reviews, and again, we relied on causal studies, kind of the most rigorous studies that, that are um, available, we identified the most effective policies and strategies that actually improve the well being of infants and toddlers and their parents. Um, and from that, we created what we're calling our state policy roadmap. And I'm going to spend most of my time, um, the rest of my time this afternoon with you, talking about the state policy roadmap. Um, and like I said, because we're committed to building the evidence base and promoting equity in, through policy, then we're also um, bringing together scholars across the field with practitioners. We're creating um, criteria that will examine every policy that we look at through an equity lens so that we can conduct equity audits on these policies and so forth. So we do not wanna stop with what we know now, but we wanna to continue to build that evidence base. And as I mentioned, part of our mission is to exchange information both across states and between state leaders and uh, scholars, and to really make sure that folks are informed and uh, using the best practices that, that are um, happening across states. I do encourage you all to visit um, us at pn3policy.org and you can look into each of these resources in much more detail. But like I said, I'm gonna focus mostly on the state policy roadmap today. And here, we started with the science of the developing child and identified these eight um, policy goals that I'll go through in just a second. And then we said, what are the most effective policies and strategies that impact outcomes related to these eight policy goals? And we are monitoring each state's progress toward implementing these policies, as well as their generosity in the policies, the reach that the policies have. Um, and we wanna see how this is changing over time. This will be an annual roadmap that we will demonstrate um, improvements in adoption of policies, as well as um, making sure that those who are eligible are actually getting them. And we're measuring 
the um, outcomes, a set of 20 outcomes that are aligned with these policy goals so that we can really understand how the well-being of infants and toddlers of their, and their parents is improving over time. These are our eight prenatal to three policy goals, and they are broad in that they are looking at things such as access to services, making sure that folks can work, that they have um, sufficient household resources, and also more specific, that we wanna make sure that kids are born healthy to healthy parents, that parents have the skills that they need in order to be the parents that they want to be, and that when children are not with their parents, that they're nurturing and responsive and safe uh, care environments. The science tells us that if we can make progress on these goals, if we can see success in this area, that children will get off to a healthy start and thrive. And then from those, we, like I said, conducted these comprehensive reviews of the most rigorous research that's been done to date and said, what are the most effective policies and strategies that states can implement in order to affect these goals. And we've identified five policies and six strategies. The policies, like I said, are these broader based supports of making sure that families have access to health care, that they um, are, can access the services that they are actually eligible for by reducing administrative burden. We pay particular attention to SNAP, but this could be um, a, across uh, several different policies. A paid family leave policy of at least six weeks following the birth, adoption, or fostering of a child. A state minimum wage that's at least $10 an hour. And a state earned income tax credit that is refundable at at least 10% of the federal EITC. That those five policies actually move the mark on improving each of those, or some of, at least one of those, um, policy goals that I just mentioned. And strategies are different from goals that's somewhat similar and that they are effective. The research says these work. How they're different is that states implement them in a wide range of circumstances and, and approaches. And there isn't one specific way that states can do this according to the research that will have the biggest impact. We're going to be watching the research. We're going to be trying to learn how states can do these things in such a way that will get the impact at the state level that you see in our um, uh, rigorous studies. But right now, um, we are saying states, you should do this. <laughs> they, they work, and we're going to continue to try to provide more guidance on how exactly they should do it. But these include comprehensive screening and referral programs, making sure that uh, child care is accessible and affordable, that um, providing group prenatal care, evidence-based home visiting programs, our early Head Start programs, and early intervention programs. Um, we, this is Texas's roadmap, but um, this is uh, what I call the grid, but this is a roadmap chart that each of the columns is one of those eight policy goals. And the dots indicate how that a, a specific policy or strategy impacts those goals. And so expanding eligibility for health insurance, basically Medicaid expansion, impacts five of those eight goals. Um, paid family leave, for instance, impacts six of these goals, whereas others are more targeted, such as comprehensive screening, it's um, improving access to services. It is actually leading to better child outcomes. Um, but states can either work from choosing the goal that they have. So for instance, they may want to improve birth outcomes and they can identify the four policies or strategies that could help them to do that. Or we provide information um, starting with the policy. They may say, we want to um, implement a paid family leave program. Tell us more about what that will do. And, and the roadmap provides that sort of guidance. Although states, um, you know, we've identified these five policies and six strategies, we have found that states are um, all over the place in terms of what they are actually doing. Um, several states are showing great progress in terms of 
the number of these effective policies that they have implemented. Um, on strategies, most states only have um, one or two of the strategies, um, but there we're showing that states are actually active in considering these and trying to find ways to make progress. If you look for Texas here, um, we do not have any of the effective policies and we do have a couple of the effective strategies. And I'm gonna go through um, the state, Texas state information just so that folks can see. It's also available on our website. And if you are not from Texas, you can get your state's information again at pn3policy.org. We did create this giant roadmap. It's a 300 page document that is great beach reading, um, but <laughs> it's actually a compilation of a, um, kind of smaller pieces of information that folks can pull out based on what they're really interested in. For each of the eight policy goals, we have about 10 pages that help to to understand why that goal is important for our littlest uh, ones, how states are currently doing in terms of meeting that goal, and what the most effective policies or strategies are that can help states to do that. And when it's at, um, appropriate in areas in which we know uh, quite a bit, we also point out the other sorts of innovative things that states are doing that to date don't have enough evidence to support that they um, are effective, but we're watching them and hoping to build that evidence base and learn more about them. This is an example of what I call our impact tables, and it's available for each of the policy goals and for each policy and strategy. But for instance, this is about increasing household resources, which we know that if we increase the resources within households, it reduces stress, it allows families to meet their basic needs, um, that economic insecurity is a really um, pernicious thing on both the parents' um, mental health as well as the child's well being. And so we show how these different policies actually impact families' well being in terms of household resources. So, for instance, the research shows that access to paid family leave can increase a household income by about $3,400 a year. It also reduces uh, poverty by two percentage points. So we provide those sorts of examples right from the most rigorous studies with the hope that folks who want to advocate for change have that information at their fingertips that they can use. We do the same thing for each of the policies and strategies where we talk about you know, what is this policy? Um, how do folks pay for it and what, you know, what is the um, federal responsibility versus the state's responsibility? What impact does it actually have on each of these goals that we lay out here? And um, how do states actually vary in the implementation of these policies, as well as their generosity and the reach of the policy? So here's another example of these impact tables. This is an example of a state earned income tax credit where we um, show both its impact on parents' ability to work, to have resources that are um, sufficient, and on birth outcomes. What was one of the most interesting findings is that some of these economic supports, like a state minimum wage or an earned income tax credit, they actually have a larger impact on birth outcomes, um, reducing adverse birth outcomes then do some of the more targeted programs that are specific to trying to prevent adverse birth outcomes. So, um, you know, the, this roadmap kind of walks you through the impact of each of these policies. I'm going to show you um, what Texas looks like in terms of where it stands on each of these policies and strategies and, um, you know, how it compares to other states. So as we mentioned earlier, Texas has um, a, uh, none of the effective policies in, currently in place, and it has two out of the six strategies. But we realize that policymaking is a long game. It doesn't happen overnight. And so we have looked at a five-year history of each state in terms of 
have they actually made progress toward adopting that policy or have they really not done anything at, at all? Um, some states, for instance, may have voted on something, but it didn't quite um, get a majority or um, they passed legislation, but it was vetoed. So, you know, these are in different places and likely to be more successful than those who um, have passed policies that actually make it really difficult to implement that, uh, um, pass laws that make it difficult to implement that policy. So we show um, in great detail on the website in the longer report about each state's uh, progress on each policy. This is an example of Medicaid expansion. And um, unfortunately, Texas is uh, you know, one of the few states that still has not expanded Medicaid. And, um, you know, which is not just a Southern thing, Louisiana, Arkansas, New Mexico, Oklahoma, they have all expanded uh, Medicaid. Um, but Medicaid expansion is really connected to the income eligibility for adults to, um, you know, have access to the program. I've spoken to several different folks who are different groups who didn't understand that childless adults are not eligible for Medicaid um, unless there's been Medicaid expansion. And that the income eligibility for parents in Texas is so low. Families have to make 17% of the federal poverty level or less in order to be um, eligible for Medicaid. And that's the lowest in the country. Um, that's if you make more than $300 a month, then you are not eligible for Medicaid. And um, it, that varies quite a bit across the country. Uh, Alabama is our nearest neighbor at 18% of income eligibility. But then it really goes up from there. And the other states that haven't expanded Medicaid are at 35 or 50% of income eligibility. And having Medicaid is also related to whether folks um, have any, you know, Medicaid expansion is related to health insurance coverage. And Texas is um, the worst in the country in terms of, especially the one that we're most interested in for our population is the percent of low income women of childbearing age who do not have any health insurance. That means that when they do become pregnant, that it takes longer for them to have access to uh, prenatal care. It means that they didn't have any sort of uh, health insurance uh, prior to becoming pregnant in order to, to be as healthy as they could when they uh, or, or to help them to plan their pregnancy. But about half of Texas uh, women of childbearing age who are lower income do not have access to health insurance. This is another area that we looked at, reducing administrative burden. And again, we paid particular attention to SNAP um, and looked across states to say, how hard is it for folks to be able to get this benefit that they're eligible for? Uh, SNAP is associated with the reduction in food insecurity. And it's a really important um, um, a part of the social safety net for so many families. And in Texas, we actually do not allow for these longer uh, recertification intervals and we require families to um, recertify every six months. And that means that that's why we have um, nearly 20% of our families who are eligible, but don't receive SNAP, or at least that's one of the reasons why. Paid family leave, uh, Texas is, um, you know, most states do not have a paid family leave policy. Uh, Colorado just uh, on Tuesday actually passed a statewide uh, paid family leave policy. There are nine states now that do, um, but there are other states that are showing progress and going to, you know, kind of get, get there quickly. Uh, only in five states can families actually take at least six weeks of leave at this point. Some have adopted the policy, but not fully implemented it. And in our barometer, we wanna make sure that families actually have the benefit before they get full credit for it. A state minimum wage is another really effective strategy at improving um, the well-being of infants and toddlers. We often think of 
the minimum wage is affecting teenagers or folks who wouldn't have children. But in Texas, we have about 14% of parents uh, with children under age three who earn less than $10 an hour. So they would all benefit from an increase in a minimum wage that has been demonstrated to have significant positive impacts on the health and well-being of families and, and economic security with really minimal impacts on employment. We also looked at the state earned income tax credit and here without having a state tax, uh, state income or a state income tax, it's very difficult for Texas to be able to implement this effective policy. Um, and then here's one of the um, strategies that Texas actually does have. It has both Family Connects policies as well as Healthy Step sites, or Family Connect sites as well as Healthy Step sites. And these are the two programs that have undergone rigorous evaluation. There are other sorts of comprehensive screening referral programs that exist across the country, and we are hoping that they will actually go under rigorous evaluation so that we can learn more about how they work and for whom and under what uh, circumstances. Um, and child care subsidies, this is something that we could talk about for a long time, but these are incredibly important, especially we know um, how important child care is right now in the wake of COVID. But the, um, the federal guidance says that at, at a minimum, that states should set their subsidy reimbursement level so that families who receive the subsidy can have access to at least 75% of the child care um, facilities or you know that are, that are offered, and um, that is not happening in Texas, and in fact, it's only happening in one state in which families um, who want to be in center-based care or home-based care would have 75% of the um, you know access to 75% of the market for their infants and toddlers. Um, we, our income eligibility is not, uh, not very, you know, not on the bad side, it's actually towards the best states. But um, where Texas is a little bit different is in the amount that we actually provide and the amount that families have to pay. This is a, a chart that's in the roadmap and I'm, I'm just showing you that we have it for every state and you can see this variability in the length of these bars that demonstrates the amount of, of the, what we call the total cost of care, what the average cost of care would be uh, in, in those markets. And then it breaks it up for you based on what the state will actually pay as a part of that cost of care, what the family is supposed to pay as a copay. Um, and so that would be the full amount that they would, uh, that the state would um, uh, provide. And then whether the family might have to pay an additional fee in order to get up to that uh, total cost of care. Uh, and in Texas, you can see that um, our overall bar is um, relatively short in terms of what our total cost of care looks like, which may mean that we're actually underestimating um, what the cost of childcare really is in order to achieve the, the high level of quality that we know is so important. But another thing to note is that um, families in Texas are responsible for nearly half of the, um, or in some instances, over half of the total cost of care. So if a family wants to access this typical um, uh, child care facility, they have to come up with $427. Um, and that, that is a, a lot of money for many families to come up with each month, um, especially families who are, have lower levels of income. Texas is also one of few states that uh, implements group prenatal care and pays for it through um, either an alternative pay payment plan or through its MCO. Um, but basically, it, it provides an enhanced reimbursement for Medicaid for group prenatal care. However, this is something that we've learned that it isn't well known in Texas and isn't broadly used uh, in the state. And um, we have one of the highest rates of women in this, uh, across the country who are not actually receiving adequate prenatal care. 
meaning that they're not getting all of the visits that um, are recommended. Um, Evidence-based home visiting programs is an area in which we're making uh, substantial progress. We have a robust program. We just have so many children that it is um, very difficult to, um, to reach all the ones that could benefit from it. So we uh, serve about 2% of our kids who would be eligible based on um, their income. Uh, and you know, that is, again, we have a huge program and it's a strong program. It just, we have a, a, a huge need in this state. And then um, an early head start, this is an opportunity for us to um, invest in a program that shows that it helps children and families not just with the child care that Early Head Start provides. It is about the engagement with the families. It's about the caring for the caregivers. Um, it, this is a program that goes beyond just child care, but actually thinks about the family and the teachers um, within, the, within the community. And finally, with um, Texas and Early Intervention, we actually have a broad criteria based on um, you know, what compared to most states, um, but we do not serve kids who are at risk for later developmental delays or disability. Um, they, that we, it, we also, um, you know, we don't serve very many kids. We need more, more services in order to increase the number of, of children who are served here. So I'm gonna, um, these are kind of my last slide here, um, but this is looking at these outcomes of, in Texas. And again, if you go to rpn3policy.org, you can find this for every state. And then you can see maps to see how each state compares to others. But you can see with Texas that there are several of these outcome measures that are really towards the low end um, uh, of the scale. And some of the areas that are really concerning, it's not just that we're at the lowest end among uninsured, um, and, but you know, our families who are eligible are not receiving the services that they're eligible for. And our parents seem to be really struggling in many ways, um, that they are saying that they're not getting the support that they need in order to really care for their kids in the way that they would like to. And we have some of the highest rates of children who are not getting those nurturing um, interactions with their parents on a daily basis, reading or singing songs and playing games and so forth. And so there are, this um, table really helps states to be able to see where they are doing well and where they have opportunities for improvement. So our work has really just started. We've spent the last year um, reviewing everything that we can to really identify these effective policies and strategies, collecting information directly from the states to find out what it is that they're doing um, and so we can track their progress. And we're going to continue to do that moving forward. With COVID, understanding how families are doing is going to be somewhat difficult. We have some incredible studies in the field that we're watching, these pulse studies, but our big uh, annual data sets that we rely on to tell us about, um, you know, th from the census information, that's going to be outdated for several years and not really reflect what families are experiencing as, uh, as a result of COVID. What won't be outdated is what states decide to do with regard to policy. And we're going to be watching each state to see whether they dig in and they try to um, really provide for these families during these incredibly difficult times, or whether they retract and cut programs and services. And so states cannot print money. Uh, we understand the budget challenges that states are going to be facing. It will likely require federal assistance for states to be able to um, do some of the policies or strategies that we know are so effective. Um, but that is something that we'll be measuring over the next um, six to eight months. We're also analyzing how much these programs cost, what the different funding mechanisms are, what the return on investment, 
we have some of that in the roadmap now, but we're going to be diving more deeply into that because obviously the first question that legislators ask is how much does it cost and then how are we going to pay for it? And like I mentioned earlier, we're spending a lot of time focused on equity that our policies, we want to look at the history of the policy, the differences across race and ethnic groups and the, the need for these policies or benefits, the difference in the access to these benefits, the experience of these policies, and of course, the difference in the impact of them. We want to see that um, families are experiencing, the, the experience of families who are um, needing these sorts of services is what it should be, and that the policies are really closing gaps and outcomes. So uh, I encourage you to reach out to us and share with us things that you know that we could learn from you. Um, and I also look forward to a conversation with you now um, to be able to learn more about um, what you're doing and what, uh, what information you're interested in. So thank you for that opportunity. Cynthia, thank you. That was terrific. Um, we're gonna start off with just a couple Q and A's and then folks who are, I'm looking at the chat. I know we're gonna talk about the centering pregnancy model in just a second to clarify. But first, um, I think the link in the chat has been put up multiple times, but I'm just gonna reiterate. If you wanna take everything that Jack said about the three principles and the conditions that families are trying to raise kids in and understand them in your state, the policy roadmap explains where we are now and how we can get to a better place. So it's really a rich, rich resource. So Cynthia, quick question for you. I'm just curious, as you and your team were going through this very rigorous process of sorting through the information about which policies and strategies have an evidence base to improve outcomes, was there anything that surprised you? Like, did you get to get like, I didn't, I didn't think that would be the case. Well, I think that there were a couple of surprises, actually. One was how big of an impact some of the policies that folks hardly ever equate with the prenatal to three space have on prenatal to three outcomes. And earned income tax credit, it, it reduces adverse birth outcomes across race and ethnic groups more so than uh, your group prenatal care, for instance. Um, a state minimum wage has a really important impact on families' health and well-being beyond just um, their economic security. And so it's not as if I didn't you know, think about the, I, of course, I know how important economic resources are for family well-being, but it was really interesting to see that sort of difference. I think that the other thing that is perhaps disappointing or a challenge for me is that we want to know more about child care and how to promote quality child care. And I think that the field is hungry for our, us to be able to say, here's what you do. Here are the ratios and the training that the teachers need and you know, the curricula that works and really promotes this sort of um, nurturing interactions between caregiver and child. And we wanted to be able to look at that and the research for infants and toddlers just isn't there yet. Um, and it's not that things are not, we're not trying to say that things don't work. It's just that we don't actually have the answers that we need at this point as to what the optimal ratio is. Not many of us are excited about having our kids being randomly uh, selected to be with, you know, four kids versus six kids versus two kids. Like those experiments don't happen. And so we are... Um, uh, following this sort of research uh, that's looking at what are the qualifications that teachers need, how do we pay them, and how does that change the outcomes for the well-being of the kids in their care. But that's an area that I wish that we had much more in. So, so, so Cynthia, we've gotten a question about group prenatal care. And I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the evidence base and why you included group prenatal care. Yeah, so uh, with group prenatal care, and again, I'm talking to a bunch of physicians out there. So this, uh, you know, I, I uh, 
understand that and, and would love to hear from you as well. Um, the group prenatal care model that's the most prominent model is the centering pregnancy model. And um, the way that this model works versus traditional prenatal care is that for moms who are lower risk in pregnancy um, can volunteer to participate in um, a, a group setting for the kind of non-medical part of your prenatal care visits. Uh, this expands the amount of time that you typically spend in prenatal care, um, up to 20 hours of prenatal care, and um, it actually increases the number of visits that moms come to. That's one of the findings uh, that, that we see that moms are actually more likely to come. There are some benefits to birth outcomes in terms of preterm births, but the benefits are higher in terms of actually um, that access to the mom of her continuing to come to the visit, as well as her level of stress and uh, sense of reduction in social, uh, you know, for not feeling so socially isolated. So the mental health um, of moms to participate in these programs seems to be improved. The program is not for every mom, um, and certainly physicians have to decide, you know, what, what, whether it's a good fit for any particular mom, and a mom has to decide if it's a good fit for her. But that's where the research on that program really stands. So the other question that we have is one, I think a, a great question. And that is that it's, it's um, the environmental impacts on individuals can't be understated, especially on the prenatal side of things. And there has been um, a couple of people who have noticed that um, environmental policy related to like lead exposure, lead screening, um, different um, screening, uh, environmental exposure screening, um, and state level policy about those weren't included in the roadmap. And I was wondering if you can kind of talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So that's an area that I would actually like to get more guidance on because we we agree completely lead levels, um, any sort of toxins that they have such a impact on the developing brain um, you know, from a real neurological and, and epigenetic level. And um, at this point, you know, we we're still conducting comprehensive reviews. We're not done. And I don't want to suggest that these are the only things that are important they are the ones that uh, we had the most evidence on, especially for, for our population and the, where we started. But I would love to get um, feedback on some specific policies with regard to toxins or the environment that folks would like for us to review so that um, you know, we, we can do that because I don't um, at all disagree with the idea of how important they are. That's awesome. Let me, there we go. Um, so there's also some uh, questions too about digging into Medicaid policy. So, um, and I think you and I have had this conversation too, is that we have this big broad idea of Medicaid, but there are so many nuances across the state. And so there, there's a couple that have been brought up in the, in the chat, like access to ABA therapy, which I know Texas Medicaid is in discussion about, and access to other, um, other things that are paid for by Medicaid. And so I know you guys are just beginning. So are you looking forward to digging a little bit into the nuances of Medicaid policy? Uh, thank you for that question. We're actually going to have a webinar in, in the first of the year that will try to explore more of how Medicaid can be leveraged to really meet so many of these other strategies that are actually on our list and, and to pay for them, as well as to do other sorts of things. I'm not a Medicaid expert. Uh, I don't pretend to be. Um, and the first step that a lot of states could take is to expand Medicaid, and that, that goes a long way, and it makes it simpler to do some of these other things that we're uh, discussing. But there was a moment as we were developing this where we're like, all roads lead back to Medicaid. With early intervention, you can, you know, have all, have that in your Medicaid plan that it covers all of those 17 elements that folks want. And it's like enhanced reimbursement for 
Family Connects or for group prenatal care. Some states use it for home visiting services. You name it, they're really creative and it matters what you write into your state plan that's, improved, that's approved. And um, so it's an area that we wanna to continue to explore and, and bring that um, information to states about how that program can be used to really, um, you know, not just provide health insurance, but to provide those prevention and uh, services that are so important. Well, fantastic. So I'm just um, muting you, uh, Cynthia, because there's a little bit of an echo, so it helps when I, I mute. Um, so first of all, I just want to say we're um, about finished with our time here. And uh, Kim, did you have another question that you would like to ask? Yes, if we have a quick second, I'd be interested, Cynthia, if you think local communities can be using that policy roadmap, which is really about state policy, but if you're seeing any communities use it more at the local level, where we know it's maybe sometimes a little easier to create change. Great question. And, um, you know, on one hand, it, like you said, this is a state policy roadmap, but it couldn't, states can't do things without also the federal government. The federal government provides the funding for the child care subsidies for SNAP, for Medicaid, you know, for so much of this. And so um, in the same way that the feds and the states have to work together and think about um, policies as kind of one unit, so do states and local communities. Um, in, in Texas, the state, the approach is often that the state funds local communities to implement some of these strategies. They're not the ones running the program. And so it really is a local community saying, this is what our community needs. We need um, to have a family connects model or uh, a healthy steps model, or we need to improve uh, and expand our early intervention services, right? And it's that sort of guidance that to the you know, input to the state about where resources are needed and how much is needed can be so important. And then communities obviously do so much to raise their own money, whether it's through philanthropy or through the local um, funding at the community level. Um, I, there's a lot going on in Austin. Houston just has you know, contributed a fund of $17.5 million to support these sorts of efforts. Um, so we're hoping that they would look at the roadmap and say, ah, we've already identified the things that are most effective. If these are a good fit for our community, like we're not trying to say that you, everyone, you have to do these things, but if these are a good fit for the needs in our community, now at least we know what is most effective to help us to get started. So um, I think that there's a lot of room for communities to use this and, and to inform us about how things are working so that we can learn from them um, on the implementation side. Perfect, thank you. I have, I have I had too many computers going on right now, um, but I we're just about out of time, and I just really want to thank you so much for joining and talking about the roadmap, roadmap, Cynthia, and I am so excited to see where you guys go in the next couple of years with it, and I know uh, we all are, and um, can't wait to see more about it, so thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you guys. Thank you very much for the opportunity to do that. And again, if there's anyone listening, I know that we gave the website and it's not a shameless plug. It really is a call for you to reach out to us. If we can share your state's information with you, if we can talk with your community, whatever we can do to be of service, because, um, you know, it, having it on a website is great, but we want it to be used by lots of people. So thank right, you again for right. the opportunity. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. I really want to appreciate um, everybody coming in and um, joining us for the first day of the summit. Like I said, we will be sending out another an email in just um, probably an hour 
to everybody with the continuing education uh, evaluation, a link to finish the continuing education evaluation. Um, you need to finish, uh, complete that evaluation to be eligible for CEs. And tomorrow uh, you can join us tomorrow at the same link you use to register for tomorrow. Make sure that you're in the first session um, when you come in. But we are so happy to, um, be done for today, not because we're happy to be done, but we are um, really excited for everybody here being here. And we are looking forward to um, having you all tomorrow as well. So thank you so much.